So now we're going to turn actually to a, a, a topic, a sujet qui a un peu en accord en fait, parce qu'on va discuter de la convergence bionumérique. Alors à peu près il y a trois ans, uh, Policy Horizons a commencé de, à regarder la convergence bionumérique. We saw that there was a lot of bio digital, uh, biological and digital technologies rather and systems that started to converge across a wide set of applications and sectors. And it went well beyond what people would qualify as biotech. So we saw that there were this as a beginning of a change of something that might alter what we call our economy, our ecosystems, and our society as a whole. So over the last years, we have published an initial scoping uh, report in 2020. Uh, we held many conversations um, within Canada, but also globally on this topic, as it was um, it, it's quite a new topic actually to, uh, at the time to start looking at. And we had last year, for those who were with us last year, maybe a reminder that we talked about this at the Futures Week when we discussed kind of uh, what biodigital convergence was and how it, uh, what were some of the weak signals of tremendous change and where things might be going. So this year, actually, we, um, we are going to talk to you more about kind of how it changes specific sectors and what it means in terms of some of the policy domains. So um, if you have more interest afterwards, you can also go to our website. We will put it in the chat also uh, of this feed. Um, you can go and look at the latest report that we have published uh, on biodigital today and tomorrow, uh, exploring the tradition towards a biodigital area. So some of the things you might hear today might be exciting. Some of the changes you might see, you might think, wow, that's amazing if that would happen. Some other things might be quite frankly scary. But it's only by considering what we might face and what might happen that we can start to envision what we want our society to be, what we want to be seeing as a reality and what we don't want to have as a reality show up so that we can kind of certainly start to think about how do we create a desirable future. So I will hand it over here to my colleagues from Policy Horizons who have been driving this work and they will then uh, present some of that and then go into a conversation with some of our uh, distinguished experts. Evelyn, Pierre-Olivier, Evan, the floor is yours. Merci, merci Christelle. Euh, bonjour tout le monde, mon nom est Pierre-Olivier euh, Desmarchais, je suis chercheur principal en perspective à Horizon euh, de Politique Canada. Donc, bienvenue à cette séance sur la convergence bionumérique. Nous sommes extrêmement heureux d'avoir cette opportunité aujourd'hui de vous présenter les grandes lignes de notre second rapport sur le sujet. Donc, sans plus tarder, je vais céder la parole à mes collègues Evelyn et Evan. Hi, I'm Evan Larmond. I'm a policy analyst here at uh, Policy Horizons Canada. Hello, my name is Avalyn Diot and I am a foresight analyst here at Policy Horizons. So, welcome. Welcome to the exploration of a new era, the biodigital. The biodigital is the merging of biology or natural things and digital technology. And when you first hear about the biodigital, this new word may sound a bit science fiction, something far off or in a distant future. But this is very much real and it's here and it's here today. So we are on the cusp of some very um, major changes and possible transitions as a result of this merging. And the transitions have the possibility to evolve quickly. As a result, the biodigital is challenging the way we understand ourselves and living things. And it could significantly disrupt many areas, many systems and many economic sectors, including the areas we will talk to you about today. They are manufacturing, health, food and agriculture, the environment, and security. And so these shifts could have far-reaching implications for various policy areas as well, including things such as global trade, manufacturing, healthcare, the shift to a low-carbon economy, and natural resource management, and many, many more. So now you're wondering, how could this evolving new domain affect so many areas at once? And more importantly, how might they affect your area of work or your area of interest? 
Well, let's begin and find out. We will start off with manufacturing. Aujourd'hui, plus de 40 pays à travers le monde ont adopté une stratégie nationale pour mettre sur pied une bioéconomie. Et parmi les secteurs clés identifiés, on retrouve dans la plupart de ces stratégies la biologie synthétique ou le génie génétique, comme étant stratégique pour assurer la compétitivité d'un point de vue économique et scientifique. Dans le cadre de nos recherches sur la convergence bio-numérique, nous avons identifié les biofonderies comme étant un moteur de changement qui pourrait avoir des impacts importants sur certains secteurs industriels et manufacturiers. C'est quoi une biofonderie? En gros, une biofonderie permet de concevoir ou de modifier des micro-organismes présents dans la nature à des fins utiles. Ce sont des plateformes de construction biologique, automatisées et intelligentes, où on a intégré des technologies numériques comme des robots afin d'optimiser les manipulations, l'intelligence artificielle qui permet d'analyser un grand volume de données et de faire des suggestions en lien avec les modifications génétiques, on y retrouve également des logiciels qui soutiennent les chercheurs dans la construction et la conception d'organismes biologiques. Et l'ensemble de ces technologies au sein de la biofonderie étant connecté, cela permet d'avoir un laboratoire dans l'info nuagique et évidemment de collaborer à distance. Avec l'aide des technologies numériques, la biologie synthétique est passée d'une forme d'art où les expérimentations exigeaient plusieurs manipulations manuelles de la part des chercheurs à une forme un peu plus industrielle et possible d'augmenter considérablement la vitesse et le nombre d'expérimentations. Aujourd'hui, les biofonderies sont déjà à l'œuvre afin de mettre au point des bios alternatives aux ressources naturelles et aux produits issus de l'agriculture et de la pétrochimie. Dans le secteur de l'énergie, plusieurs projets visent à modifier génétiquement des algues et à utiliser l'intelligence artificielle afin de réduire les coûts associés à la production de biocarburants. Le cannabis, on le cultive à l'extérieur ou en serre, mais ce qui a de la valeur dans cette plante, ce sont deux substances, soit le THC et le CBD. Les chercheurs en Californie ont transféré des gènes d'un plant de cannabis dans un type de levure utilisé dans le brassage de la bière afin qu'elle synthétise lors de la fermentation les deux substances. Évidemment, ce sont uniquement deux exemples parmi des centaines, voire des milliers de bio-alternatives qui pourraient émerger au cours des 15 prochaines années. Une bioéconomie alimentée par les biofonderies pourrait avoir une portée très large et bouleverser plusieurs secteurs à la fois, transformer le commerce international et les chaînes d'approvisionnement. Ce qui est important de bien comprendre, c'est qu'en tant que plateforme de construction biologique, une grande partie de la valeur économique de la bioéconomie dans l'avenir pourrait résider dans l'optimisation et la maîtrise des technologies utilisées au sein de la biofonderie. Un petit nombre d'entreprises ou d'organisations détenant ces biofonderies pourraient ainsi compétitionner avec des, des entreprises sectorielles. Nous allons maintenant voir comment la convergence bionumérique pourrait changer le secteur de la santé. So, the current state of healthcare systems is for the most part reactive. Biodigital convergence has the potential to facilitate the shift to P4 medicine that is predictive, preventative, personalized and participatory. So some of these shifts that we're seeing today are synthetic organs and digital implants. Because of advancements in both 3D printing and tissue engineering, we are able to bioprint functional organ tissues that soon may become full organs for transplant. The first therapeutic digital implants that use deep brain stimulation can correct neurological disorders like Parkinson's or depression. Advancements in AI have led to brain-computer interfaces that can decode complex brainwave patterns, allowing users to control devices using just their thoughts. Also, gene editing technology has facilitated many breakthroughs in healthcare research. We are just now seeing the first clinical uses of gene therapies where disease-causing genes are able to be turned off. Alzheimer's and many other heritable diseases may potentially be treated using gene silencing technology. When it comes to embryo or germline editing, there are global bans with a few exceptions for research as the ethical debates on the perceived risk versus benefits are ongoing. Finally, the increasing amount of health data collection has been accelerated with health apps, smartphones, and wearables. AI can be trained on these data and work as diagnostic and prevention tools by analyzing our voices and facial expressions. 
For example, one application called face to gene is able to identify over 300 rare diseases using facial recognition. Also, rise in popularity of gene sequencing services is leading to growing biodatabases containing genetic information. Some biodatabases may share data with researchers to find genetic causes behind rare genetic diseases. Biodigital innovations in healthcare may raise a number of challenges and opportunities in privacy, equity, and intellectual property in the pursuit of universal well being. Food security is one of these challenges. So today, agriculture relies primarily on land, water, and a suitable climate. However, some significant changes are occurring that could disrupt this area. Three ways that food and agriculture could shift. One is we could see an increase in lab-grown food or cellular agriculture. This is probably one of the fastest growing industries today. Economic investments and opportunity certainly is a driver here, but there's also environmental pushes for this kind of food production. One consideration could be geographic location and food security in the adoption of these new technologies. For example, Singapore aims to have 30% of its food domestically produced. So that means in a lab or in a ver vertical farm by 2030. The second is precision farming, and it could become more common. This is using digital technologies to control and to monitor environments. So we could grow food in climates and locations that normally wouldn't have been able to grow food before. This type of innovation could enable a decentralization of food production. It could affect trade, transport, food security, and supply chains. And third, and perhaps a more less known innovation we're seeing is something called nutrigenomics. And essentially this is DNA profiling and the relationship between your genes, nutrition, and your health. There is also microbiome personalization too. So we're seeing um, startups or restaurants specializing in food that are tailored for your genome or your biome. There is a decreasing cost to analyze genomes and biomes, and that's part of the growing trend here. But there is also a shift to this desire to understand the uniqueness of each human. So you can see the potential spillover effect what is driving a shift in food and agriculture could actually have implications on health, on privacy, on data, on sustainability, and certainly have key considerations for our environment. And this brings us to our next sector. So let's explore what are the potential shifts in the environment. So climate change and loss of biodiversity are some of the greatest challenges that we face today. And this has forced us to come up with a number of innovations that might help us reach our goals of reducing carbon emission and protecting our ecosystems. So here are some ways that biodigital could change the environment. First, genetic alterations to some plants or animals may create more resilient ecosystems through forest fire resistant trees or reviving extinct species. Plants or algae could be altered to remove carbon dioxide from the air more efficiently and even convert that carbon into fuel or fertilizer. Gene drives have been tested on mosquito populations in Florida to slow the spread of malaria. Secondly, plants and fungi are found to have the ability to detect chemicals and send signals through complex root networks similar to like an internet of living things. Studies have been able to adapt this system to send electronic signals like emails in the presence of certain pollutants. DNA has been used as a means of storing data by using gene editing to modify DNA bases like the ones and zeros of a computer. Theoretically, a forest could be used as biological data storage for digital information. And finally, biosensors placed in the environment could automatically monitor environmental DNA, which is the collection of genetic information from multiple species in an ecosystem for changes in migration of different species as a response to climate change. This information could potentially better inform how we make decisions that concern the well-being of these ecosystems. Synthetic biology companies that extract genetic resources from the environment without compensation to the local communities is known as biopiracy. Safeguards such as biodiversity databases or biocultural labels might be ways for communities to protect their culture and resources. Ecosystems are beginning to gain rights for their protection against human development, which may be a sign of a shift in perspective towards the natural world. 
the biomonitoring of ecosystems may also have security considerations in the way we protect against bio threats. Le cinquième et dernier secteur que nous avons identifié dans notre étude est celui de la sécurité. Plusieurs innovations bien numériques créent de nouveaux outils qui pourraient modifier les techniques de surveillance, optimiser les enquêtes criminelles et finalement être utilisés pour développer de nouvelles armes bio biologiques. Premièrement, l'accessibilité aux données biologiques. La baisse considérable des coûts associés au séquençage de l'ADN au cours des 20 dernières années a permis à des organisations privées et publiques de créer des bases de données biologiques. En parallèle, on a vu apparaître sur Internet des plateformes qui permettent aux utilisateurs de télécharger leur profil génétique afin d'obtenir de l'information sur leurs ancêtres ou sur leur santé. Et déjà, ces données biologiques soulèvent plusieurs questions en termes de sécurité et de vie privée. Aux États-Unis, des juges ont ordonné à des entreprises privées qui hébergent ces bases de données de permettre aux autorités policières d'y accéder afin d'élucider des crimes non résolus. À l'aide de l'intelligence artificielle, des organisations tentent de générer le portrait d'une personne à partir de son ADN. Ceci pourrait éventuellement venir renforcer les systèmes de reconnaissance faciale et d'identification qui sont déjà en place dans certains pays. Mais quels seront les véritables impacts des bases de données biologiques sur la sécurité nationale? L'année dernière, une entreprise étrangère qui commercialise de l'équipement de séquençage dans le, à travers le monde a été accusée par les États-Unis de collecter des données génétiques et de les transférer sur une base de données située dans son pays d'origine. On peut certainement se poser la question, quels seraient les impacts si un pays étranger détenait une bonne partie des profils génétiques des Canadiens? Comment cette information pourrait être utilisée? Deuxièmement, les innovations bionumériques soulèvent plusieurs préoccupations du point de vue de leur double usage. Par exemple, les technologies de modification du génome CRISPR ou la biologie synthétique pourraient être utilisées dans le développement de nouveaux virus et ainsi servir d'armes biologiques. Est-ce que les autorités et les services de sécurité seront en mesure de détecter la signature de pathogènes génétiquement modifiés? On a également remarqué au cours des dernières années l'utilisation de l'intelligence artificielle pour accélérer la recherche de nouvelles thérapies contre certaines euh, maladies. Est-ce si difficile de modifier l'algorithme de recherche qui suggère des molécules qui seraient bénéfiques pour la santé humaine afin qu'il suggère à la place des molécules qui seraient toxiques voire mortelles? Et comment les autorités pourront-elles détecter ces algorithmes? Même si la convergence bionumérique est très prometteuse pour enrayer des maladies incurables ou éliminer des espèces envahissantes de nos écosystèmes, elle soulève néanmoins des questions importantes quant à la sécurité et à la vie privée des individus, à la sécurité nationale et aux moyens de prévenir toute forme de menace biologique. So we are just now at the cusp of the biodigital era. While we push the limits of understanding and controlling biological entities, the convergence notably promises to strengthen our food security, reduce the carbon footprint of our economies, provide new treatments for incurable diseases, and increase and improve our life expectancy. However, along with these benefits, it imposes new challenges in terms of privacy and cybersecurity with the explosion and digitization of biological data. It could disrupt international trade and rural economies with the emergence of bioalternatives from local and urban bioproduction. It will force governments to manage the risks and scientific uncertainties of releasing genetically modified organisms into the environment for economic, health, or conservation reasons. In terms of social cohesion, biodigital convergence could fuel disinformation and accentuate polarization. And finally, in terms of ethics, it may raise the greatest debate of the 21st century on the modification of the human genome and future generations. So by thinking deeply about this convergence, assessing the risks, but also the opportunities, this could allow Canada to better be better prepared for the biodigital era. So now moving on to our expert panel Q&A, it is our pleasure to introduce our moderator for the session, Dr. Vic Penn. 
Vic is a partner in the data and analytics practice where he focuses on client value realization through the creative and innovative application of data science and AI. Prior to joining PwC, Vic served as the chief scientist and chief science advisor for, chief nat for Natural Resources Canada, a federal ministry within the government of Canada. So Vic, welcome to our session. Thank you, Evan. It's my pleasure to be here and a very sincere thanks to uh, Jean-Francois Tremblay and Crystal and the entire Policy Horizons uh, team for organizing this very interesting event. And I, and I read the report and I also heard with keen interest the excellent opening remarks that you presented to this session. So just so much for our panelists, our distinguished guests to really uh, talk about here. So without further ado, I'd like to get uh, right into the, into the heart of this conversation. And I, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Sherry Pictou. Um, Dr. Sherry Pictou is a Mi'kmaq woman from uh, Letitsuk, known as Bear River First Nation, Nova Scotia. She's an assistant professor in the faculties of law and management at Dalhousie University, focusing on gender and indigenous governance. Dr. Pictou is also former chief for her community and the former co-chair of the World Forum of Fisher Peoples. She's a member of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Task Force on Indigenous and Local Knowledge. More recently, she became the first female district chief for the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. So uh, on behalf of Policy Horizons and the organizing team, uh, welcome, uh, Sherry. And I'd like to uh, ask the first question, which is uh, from an indigenous perspective, what do you think about the topic of biodigital convergence? Thank you for that wonderful introduction and greetings from my homelands, uh, Mi'kmaq. Um, while I appreciate what um, biodigital technologies has to offer or the proposition that they will contribute to our well-being, uh, health and well-being, I worry about the impact on the ever-increasing disparities, or to put it another way, uh, on the great social and e ecological injustices that seem to be growing. Um, inherent in many Indigenous languages, including mine, there are concepts about our obligation, our human obligation, to ensure that the ecological integrity of our resources is upheld. Um, this is based on a principle to ensure that the health of the ecological integrity is there, not only for humans to consume, but for ecologic, ecological existence within its own right. And so at the same time, we do know how neoliberal assumptions about economic development do not necessarily uh, lead to social well-being. Yet it is domestic and international neoliberal economic systems that predominate policies on an act in the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and here in Canada, the legal duty to consult with Indigenous people. So if we're going to use uh, biodigital production to replace pr um, certain species, food systems that feed into the existing uh, global economic structures as it is without transforming those structures, will we be in fact just privatizing or commodifying biodigitality in ways that will reproduce those inequities? And I do question about um, question, I have a lot of questions about biodigital reproduction of certain species without taking into consideration the interrelationship that those species have with one another within ecosystems. And so in order to prevent the negative and harmful impacts that we have witnessed uh, from, from um, neoliberal policies, we will have to really in my view, interrogate those policies, particularly when it comes to the production of biodigital technologies uh, that, it, that we drastically, to the point that we drastically consider issues such as free prior and informed consent, intellectual property rights, land claim processes, and Aboriginal and treaty rights. It cannot be an afterthought, which was the case with the sustainable development goals. Um, it should be noted that Indigenous people had to fight long and hard to have the world recognize how the Sustainable Development Goals impacted, all 17 impacted them. And I'll just quickly end on a note that just, just 
you look at the global pandemic, it was my understanding that in 2020, only 16.2% of the low income countries uh, received the first dose of the vaccine. And my understanding that hasn't changed much. I think in a New York Times article just recently, it still stands at 17%. So I worry about the inequities and, and particularly the impact that, that will, the, this will have on Indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sherry, for sharing your deep insights into this most important of facets related to this topic. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome our next uh, expert uh, in the conversation, uh, Professor Lionel Clark, co-chairs the UK's Engineering Biology Leadership Council, uh, which is an independent advisory group formerly called the Synthetic Biology Leadership Council, alongside George Freeman, then the UK's Minister for Science, Research and Innovation. He was responsible for issuing the UK Synthetic Biology Roadmap in July 2012 and a strategic plan for UK Synthetic Biology titled Bio Design for the Bioeconomy in 2016. He was an advisor to the U.S. National Research Council study, Industrialization of Biology in 2015. He is a visiting professor in the Department of Bioengineering in Imperial College and holds an honorary professorial chair in the Faculty of Chemistry in the University of Manchester. In 2018, uh, Dr. Clark was awarded an Order of the British Empire for services to synthetic biology, and he's now engaged in developing engineering biology responses to the UK innovation strategy. So with that, uh, Professor Clark, I'd like to start by asking you this question. Uh, synthetic biology is not new, and we've read a lot about the benefits about shifting to biomanufacturing in terms of environmental footprint and as well as economic competitiveness. Having said that, what are the barriers for synthetic biology applications to truly scale up to industrial level and then start to dominate the market? Thank you very much uh, for, for that introduction. Uh, it, indeed, the challenge to scale up are enormous. The biggest single barrier is the enormous scale that may be required. Um, and our current focus, and the one that uh, I'm going to pick particularly on the manufacturing aspects that uh, we heard in the, in the previous introduction, was how to replace the fuels, chemicals and materials that are currently generated using fossil fuel feedstocks. Um, in order to do that, the scale of sustainably sourced bio-based alternatives will need to be in enormous. And at the same time as governments around the world are committing to halve their carbon footprints within the coming decade uh, on the route to net zero by 2050, petrochemical markets are currently being predicted to potentially to double towards a trillion dollar revenue business by 2030. In other words, going in the opposite direction. So the first and greatest barrier is simply to find a way to compete with such massively funded and highly optimized supply systems. And they are indeed um, very integrated over 100 years and so on. So this is not something to easily replace. And yet the important thing is to note that the end products uh, in the petrochemicals, I'll use my main example here, span a huge range uh, from shampoos to textiles, from detergents to tyres, from aspirin to pesticides. So the barriers to scale up should not be envisaged in terms of simply replacing the nature of the feedstock or even the main intermediate components such as ethane and polyethylene, but a chipping way at each and all of the many thousands of applications that could replace the entire supply chains. And in so doing, to create a more distributed network of biorefineries uh, and specialist channels to market. Uh, you, you question about dominate the market. Personally, I don't see that as a, a particular direct goal for synthetic biology. If more conventional methods can deliver sustainable products, that's fine. The challenges are so great. I think it's likely that the more cutting edge of aspects of synthetic biology are likely to play an ever more significant role over time uh, to, to meet the long term market demand. So that's in, in general terms. We have seen it can uh, respond quickly, switching quickly to the health aspects, uh, the development of the mRNA uh, uh, COVID vaccines was done in extraordinarily rapid time uh, due to the fact that the technologies were in place. Uh, they were being developed for cancer treatments and, and other 
other medical uh, uh, aspects. And then suddenly, here's a pandemic, and well, we've got the technologies, we've got the techniques, uh, let's apply them. The problem there for, was, was not, not to come up with uh, new solutions. Uh, the, the problem there for scale up was a combination of ensuring the safety through the regulation, which is absolutely correct, uh, but then also to determine where such products could be uh, actually developed and produced. Uh, and indeed, suddenly a supply chain uh, issue was um, alerted. Uh, and indeed, that will have contributed uh, to, in no small measure to, to the problem of, of inequitable uh, de, um, use of, of the uh, or, or availability of, of the vaccines more globally. Um, so just moving quickly to the more technical level, I think at the broadest level, the main barriers are going to be a failure to recognise a significantly new approach to manufacturing needs to be established if we're not to remain trapped by the short term financial competitiveness of conventional fossil based industries. Um, and, and it's not necessarily the fossil based companies, uh, the oil companies and so on uh, that we, we're familiar with are resistant, but actually they themselves are trapped within their own infrastructure in investments and skill bases. So this needs to be supported by governments to manage the wholesale transition towards a new form of manufacturing that's much more sustainable and resilient to uh, future challenges. We will need to engage a broader society in understanding the steps that will need to be taken to develop industries of the future, to engage people, to develop the skills, the local supply chains. I would expect to see scale, not so much scale up, but scale out. So it will be about how we develop uh, that um, acceptance and enthusiasm and support uh, for uh, a much more diverse and uh, uh, um, di distributed um, form of, of, of scale up. Um, so ultimately that leads to uh, ensuring, uh, we, we're talking I know in this uh, whole conference about vision. It's about a vision for a set of value drivers that are more than just short term financial economic value. It's about value drivers that will encompass much more of the uh, long-term environmental sustainability, climate change, biodiversity, and the like. If those can be brought together, and we can help, and we can develop both global and local vision, and support that through government, that I think then we'll start to create a framework in which uh, the, um, the, the the whole area of synthetic biology can start to scale up uh, to, to, to a level that will eventually allow us to step away from the current dependence on petrochemicals. So I think uh, eventually it is around recognizing that value chains themselves need to change uh, and developing the regulations, uh, removing regulatory burdens uh, that are perhaps based on uh, uh, perceptions that were developed 50, 100 years ago, when in fact our understanding of biology has been transformed within the last 10 to 20 years, and to make sure that we can adapt and develop and build on the frontiers of understanding. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lionel, for sharing your deep insights from a, an industrial as well as a technical perspective. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Eric Ward, uh, who's an assistant commissioner for strategic initiatives and external relations with the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. Uh, Eric recently joined the IPC from the Government of Canada, where his career spanned law, policy, management, and strategic foresight. Uh, and immediately prior to joining the IPC, Eric was the Senior Director at Policy Horizons Canada, the Federal Government Centre for Strategic Foresight, and our host for today. Eric holds degrees in civil and common law from McGill University. So welcome, Eric. And my question is, we're seeing more and more applications and platforms offering DNA sequencing services to the public. More and more people are ordering these uh, use at home type DNA testing kits. And moreover, we're seeing a DNA marketplace being built where users can share their bio details with different actors. So in terms of privacy, do you see any issues? What are the implications of this? 
The short answer is that, yes, I do see uh, issues. The, the long answer could probably fill 10,000 PhD theses. Uh, but what I, I guess what I'd say today is there's some obvious and less obvious ways that this might uh, engage our thinking and change the way that we think about privacy. Uh, first is the obvious one. There is, uh, there is implicit in the biodigital convergence an explosion of sources of information, intimacy of information, and, uh, and even new types of biological information about humans and about the biological environment that surrounds humans. And, and, uh, and, and the biodigital convergence forces us to realize that those, two, those things are not neat, neatly bounded from each other. Uh, and, uh, and so, of course, that, that amplifies all the privacy, uh, quest classic privacy questions around collection, use, and disclosure about information that identifies humans. But it also challenges our core concepts that we use in privacy. One of the core concepts is identifiability, and it sort of acts as an off-on um, switch for whether there's a privacy interest. And I think that's really coming under pressure in the digital uh, society. It, I think it it is uh, under tremendous pressure in the bio, that concept under tremendous pressure in the biodigital society, as uh, we see the, uh, the ways in which our in unavoidable biological uniqueness is constantly expressed and being picked up through uh, bio, uh, sort of biodigital inter interfaces. And um, the idea that there is a sort of a separate package of personal information or personal biological information that we all hold and make careful little consent decisions about who can have what is, uh, is I think, going to be very difficult to hold. That calls on a new, probably more ethics-based uh, uh, approach to privacy and privacy reg regulation. It's going to call on us to really grow up about the systems uh, and, be, and be honest about the systems and the hidden wiring that we're building around us that will share this kind of information in, in sort of very complex environments that will be difficult, if not impossible, for a person to understand individually in great detail, and particularly, uh, you know, um, uh, children growing into that world who take it for granted but haven't been acquainted with how it uh, how it's developed, or people who didn't grow up in that world and are trying uh, trying to adjust to uh, to that in, that new information world, and then. Um, finally, I'd say that, first of all, this is groundbreaking foresight. I think Canada should be extremely proud of it. And congratulations to Horizons for, for driving it forward. Um, one of the things it helps us do is illuminate the, the biodigital convergence in the present and show us some of the stakes uh, that, uh, of, of our present decisions. And I draw your attention to your, the audience's attention to two. Uh, one is some really interesting work on the uh, federal provincial territorial guidelines uh, by the commissioners, uh, the various information commissioners and privacy commissioners across the country on facial recognition technology. I think if you look at that, you'll start to see how we're inching into the ethics of, of biodigital uh, uh, privacy and transparency. And another is a very, uh, an interesting recent decision by the tribunal associated with the Ontario Information and Privacy Commission. You'll find it under the, the, uh, the grabbing uh, name uh, uh, PHIPAA Decision 175. But this is a crucial moment, and there's a, there's a bit of foresight in, uh, built into this. Uh, what this looked at is that there was a, a medical company that was a, or a sort of a medical record software company. They were helping to maintain these systems that run the electronic health record. They were... Um, they were de-identifying the information that was in the systems and then selling that information, which ultimately is, a, is sort of a precursor to biodigital information to third parties to do other things. And now, and, and the, the tribunal held that that was a use, the de-identification and, and was a use. So we're starting to see privacy build out into that hidden wiring of, of bioinformation and it's being built around us. And also that there was insufficient um, transparency about how that was, uh, how that um, de-identification was being uh, used. And so I can, I think you can see under the pressure of um, the growth of biological information and health information, we're starting to shift our, uh, uh, shift or, or confirm the ways that we're seeing that. And Horizons Horsight is, is helping a great deal. Thank you, uh, Eric, for explaining a, a multifaceted and a many dimensional subject in a very straightforward way. 
Uh, I'd like to now uh, ask uh, the next question to Sherry. And, and Sherry, we know that there are negotiations under the Convention on Biological Diversity on digital, uh, on, on uh, bi uh, biological diversity on digital uh, sequence information. The biodigital convergence may accelerate the collection and analysis of species DNA and their exchange between nations and researchers over the coming decade. Uh, do you see any challenges or opportunities from a conservation perspective? Yeah, once again, I, I just want to point out, even with the uh, Convention on Bio Digital, uh, Bio Biological Diversity, that Indigenous peoples were largely left out of that uh, process. And this has been voiced um, for, in, for some time in the development of the, the uh, CBD and also in the decision-making processes following. In fact, I think in the mid-2000s, there was an ad hoc working group on access and benefit sharing, and they have a report concerns related to the SBD process. And uh, there was many concerns uh, regarding Indigenous peoples and their human rights, and central to those was the dispossession and the displacement of Indigenous peoples' rights. So. Again, just to reiterate, it's been, you know, it's been, uh, it's just starting now to start, it's just now starting to be recognized how um, that um, Indigenous knowledge can contribute to biodiversity. And I think biodigital convergence holds some possibilities to, to assist in that. Uh, as long as it doesn't, it's not used in ways that further displace Indigenous peoples from their ancestral homelands and rights to self-determination, including the big initiative here in Canada on Indigenous protected and conserved areas. Will they truly be Indigenous or will they be, you know, Indigenous-led? Will we be able to uh, use Indigenous knowledge in, 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 in that process? And... Um, and can we use it in a way that upholds the ecological integrity and balance uh, in balance with human consumption? So from my point of view, the biodigital era creates an interesting but concerning paradox for humankind and their relationship to the rest of creation. While it brings us closer, um, the biodigital era can deepen our interconnection with non-human life. Well, you know, I have questions, will it create or add another higher level? hierarchical relationship where humans continue to dominate over non-human species in ways that um, disrupt, well, further disrupt that balance and the whole notion of conserve and biodiversity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, Lionel, next I'd like to come to you. And, you know, given the supply chain disruptions from the pandemic and the geopolitical upheavals and conflicts in the world today, uh, what role do you think might biomanufacturing play in the context of the global supply chains? Thank you. I think there are two key issues here, one of which is around energy security and the other is food security. And I guess perversely, the efforts of Putin to invade Ukraine is actually likely to accelerate the conversion away from fossil to renewable energy as Europe uh, decides it, it has, has to move away. Suddenly, those thoughts which uh, were for the future are now immediate and, and urgent. So it's providing an, actually a significant opportunity for biomanufacturing to step up to the challenge and demonstrate the alternatives that are now becoming possible and actually get them on the table sooner than they might otherwise have been considered uh, economically appropriate. Um, the, in terms of supply chains, though, the big difference is the bio is potentially very distributed. Much of the developing world is, is predominantly agriculture. It could start to play a much greater role in delivering some of the feedstocks that could be fed into a more globally distributed network of supply hubs. One way this might be developed would be if new forms of biointermediate components are generated in various parts of the world, used as a basic building blocks for upgrading to more specialist end products nearer the customer markets. You could envisage a very different global supply chain. The most important thing, though, behind that question is, is we have to look to the long term. The short term is, is one of massive volatility. All prices were negative two years ago. Now they're going through the roof. 
if if um, if Russia can't sell its oil uh, in the immediate future, it's only a matter of time before a huge supply glut will be available. Oil prices could collapse, and we're back down at somewhere where we were um, a few years ago. So expect volatility, but we have to have a long-term view that sustainable bio alternatives has to be a basis for a whole new global order of supply chains. Thank you, uh, thank you, Lionel. Uh, so. Uh, Eric, the next question comes to you, and, and this has to do with the fact that the public is now more aware of genetic profiles, and in your mind, could this open up new ways of, uh, of seeing differences within society that will eventually lead to genetic discrimination? Thank you for that. Yes, I, I think that there's, um, of course, with new knowledge, uh, one of the ways that our, that our institutions and our society has dealt with new knowledge uh, and particularly new knowledge that falls into our surveillance systems is to start to socially sort people to create categories and to uh, and then which raises these um, these issues of discrimination and you can imagine that a new biological knowledge um, uh, drawn or harvested from people's lives or from their bodies could create new opportunities for that kind of abuse uh, so, and I can I can understand why, particularly in across the 20th century, and still many who are concerned with diversity, uh, respect for diversity, and anti-discrimination, um, are very uh, cautious about biology, even to the point of sometimes wanting to uh, reject or ignore biology or deny the, the the power of biological insight. And and I I completely understand that because misinterpretation and misuse of biology was really uh, part of the worst uh, and traumatic horrors of the 21st century or of the 20th century and no one wants a repeat of that. Uh, I do think there's a danger in ignoring the growing um, uh, relevance of biological knowledge and the bio, and the bioinformatic systems that are around us um, for those of us who uh, who uh, care about diver diversity and anti-discrimination that field shouldn't be left um, uh, sort of uh, left open and I'm really pleased to see uh, writers such as Elizabeth Wilson who wrote Gut Feminism, uh, Julieta Singh who's just written some really fascinating uh, books and many others who are driving a re-engagement with, uh, with biology uh, and seeing its potential not, not necessarily, and this is part of the vision I guess, not necessarily to divide us up into groups for um, social sorting and differential treatment, but for an understanding of our shared vulnerability using better, more uh, true, uh, you know, or, or better uh, appreciations of biology to see how we're really embedded, how we're interconnected, how these categories uh, sort of uh, bleed and share and the, the, um, uh, that, we, uh, that we share much more uh, with each other and to appreciate and value the biological um, evolution of diversity and how necessary that is um, uh, for us as, as, as societies. So um, I guess I would, I would say that the, one of the areas of inspiration for this is the way that a, a group that was previously the object of a kind of disease classification as uh, the way that autism was previously understood uh, has grown through, uh, partially through advocacy and better understanding of, uh, of the partial biological basis of these things um, to become a community, to advocate and in fact to, uh, to generate a, great, a greater social recognition and understanding of the value of that diversity and what it can bring to, uh, of neurodiversity and what it can bring to us. There I think is a little bit of a model for how this, uh, how biodigital bio might uh, lead to a, uh, a, a kind of an appreciation society, and if I might even say, maybe an evolution from a knowledge society to one that that could hope to be a wisdom society. Thank you, uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, just great insights there as well. So now we can shift to the last question, and I'd like to uh, essentially ask the question to Sherry, and then pass the mic to Lionel, and then to Eric. And the question has to do with uh, something about bioethics. So we know that over the last two years, we've seen conspiracy theories being shared about COVID and fake news. We hear about this notion of the post-truth era. And given the capabilities of the biodigital convergence to modify the living, create new kinds of food in vitro, enhance human capabilities with sensors, etc., what do you think could be the impacts of mis- and disinformation, as well as fake news on biodigital convergence innovations and the regulatory approval and framing. And a quick follow-up is what could be the best approach to deal with its impact? So Sherry, Lionel, and Eric, the floor is yours. 
Okay, I think uh, I'll just start with answering your last question. That's such a heavy question. And just very briefly is that I, I think that the whole process of how this bio, this era of bio digitality progresses has to be very transparent, really transparent. And we did see all those uh, misconceptions and, and, and conspiracy theories and so forth. However, the lack of transparency contributes to those. And this is quite complicated. And I'm thinking in terms of the pandemic that even here in Canada, how we reopened and how now the daily numbers are not even in our consciousness. We don't know the number of people dying and so forth, unless you really look. And I know here, like in the province of Nova Scotia, we have to check on a weekly basis and so forth. And that raises great concern for me because when we started out, we were so on such a strict, uh, uh, you know, we had strict guidelines. And when it opened up and then we were kind of left to ourselves to defend ourselves, to determine, you know, what, what's the best protocols to follow and so forth. I'm not saying this for everybody, but it sort of gave that appearance. It sort of fed into those conspiracy theories. And so this is just, I think we should take a lot of lessons from how the pandemic was handled. It's um, very interesting because I know how difficult it is for governments to respond, particularly in uncertain areas, areas, or areas such as the pandemic and how to respond to that in uncertain times. And I just want again to reemphasize there's something to be said about uh, the economy and the relation to um biodigitality in terms of reproducing such things as vaccines that it does not necessarily close the gap on inequities we still have 17 percent of the um the uh, low income uh countries still not being able to access and it really reminds me of the aids pandemic back in the 80s thank you Yeah, thanks for the question. I would say in, in addition to or partly motivating um, the disinformation and the difficulties of sense making that we're going to have across uh, what is, what is a, a, a real dislocating um, uh, transition into, into biodigital uh, society is, um, is that there, I think there's a real danger of a kind of um, politics of disgust, a, uh, um, because the biodigital starts to challenge some of the, um, can challenge for many of us, some of our, our core uh, uh, sense of what the world is like, what humans are like, what social relationships are like, what food is like. And these are things that are, they're, they're not out there. They're very close to our, uh, to our lives. And, it, and the um, uh, uh, politics of revulsion uh, or at least a, a partial revulsion response to some of what's happening uh, can, I think, be very difficult to um, uh, to deal with. And uh, one of the dangers, of course, is uh, is then these um, sort of uh, switchbacks between um, Wild West and then moral panic and then Wild West and moral panic. This is not a good sense-making environment for negotiating our way maturely into, into a different set of, of social and industrial uh, relations. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to see some great Canadian leadership at, at Horizons on, uh, on sense-making. I think it's key to the biodigital um, futures and also at places like CIGI, uh, Chris Beal is leading some, uh, Chris Beal is leading some, uh, some excellent work there. There's lots of folks who I think are 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 attending to the the information and sense making environment that we're going to need in order to deal with the biodigital environment. Thank you. If uh, if I can just add to, to, to those those excellent responses, um, having been involved in writing a roadmap for synthetic biology over a decade ago. Uh, we only wrote that after we had gone through an extensive public dialogue. What do the people think? What's our starting point? What are their fears? We need to understand those. And throughout uh, the last 10 years or more, when I have seen news uh, from wherever or challenges, I've always been keen to read them carefully because whether I agree or disagree, I know there's always something driving that concern. There is something there. Have I missed something? What are, what, what, are we listening properly? 
Um, and it's become clear um, that clearly fake information can have, have a profound in, uh, impact. You only need a newspaper headline uh, damning some aspect of, of, of synthetic food or something, and, 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 and every, everyone is, is pushing back against that. Uh, and yet what I've noticed in the last few years, if anything, is rather than technology push and saying we're doing it because we can, and you may be scared, but we're going to do it anyway, rather there are massive issues and concerns out there being driven by climate change, by, by food security, by concerns for biodiversity in the natural world, which is saying, can you find solutions? Where can those solutions be found? And so I'm actually detecting, uh, so I, I'd like to finish on a positive note that actually there, there is a, a, a considerable market pull. The question is, do we do it right? And do we get overexcited and start doing things we shouldn't do? Uh, the sort of challenge that's intrigued me uh, when, when, when I have read it, uh, I'll give an example that uh, it became clear that one could uh, synthesize artemisinin uh, as an anti-malarial. And yet there was a considerable pushback from certain uh, certain quarters saying, oh, but this is terrible. You're going to put Chinese wormwood farmers out of, out of uh, uh, you, you know, their, their livelihoods. Now, now, that actually is a legitimate and important aspect. But the fact that a baby even today uh, is dying uh, under the age of five, a baby is dying every two minutes, suggests that, that actually there's still a problem to be solved. You can't, uh, which you put f first forward. So uh, what we recognize is that it, there's going to be change. And that change will, has to be for the greater benefit, but change always, there are some winners and losers. We must be more mindful of where the losing areas could be. Uh, so losing your job as a coal miner might be, might be something which we're going to have to face up to with climate change. I think be more aware and recognize and try to adjust uh, to those, listen to and adjust to those C concerns and hopefully collectively we will finish up with um, something which actually okay it, it's not a matter fact that that fat news actually doesn't stand up the point is most people do want uh, uh, alternatives to meat occasionally and so on and so forth uh, and synthetic biology uh, may well have some of the tools and techniques necessary to to, to respond to the bigger market need and demand that we're now uh, envisaging. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lionel. And also to uh, Sherry and Eric for your uh, thoughtful and thought provoking remarks. So this brings us uh, near the close of our session, this session today. And I think if we were to summarize, it's quite clear that biological and digital systems are coming together in many profound ways, creating uh, this new domain called the biodigital. And uh, we know, for instance, digital technology and living organisms, living things are able to increasingly communicate with each other. We can embed digital technology into living organisms and incorporate biological components into new technologies and also genetic modification of the natural world for climate change mitigation, environmental remediation, and biodiversity conservation unlock many new opportunities. However, as our experts noted today, they do also bring attendant ethical and moral considerations with them. I think one thing that became very clear throughout our conversation was that the contours of the coming biodigital era are becoming sharper and more apparent. And this conversation explored the change drivers and the transformation drivers, the levers of how biodigital convergence could transform the many important uh, sectors and areas of our life. So thank you to Policy Horizons for convening this most excellent uh, panel discussion, and I'd like to pass it back to our Master of Ceremonies. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. It's indeed a lot of, to think about. A lot of scary stuff might happen. A lot of great things could happen. It's certainly time to start reflecting on it. And I um, also want to mention that Eric was actually, he's very enthusiastic about the work. Uh, he was also spearheading uh, the work. He started the work when he was with us. So thank you very much, Eric. Um, so to everyone, miigwech, merci, thank you. And thank you to our moderator, Vic, our panelists, Sherry, Lionel, and Eric. So we've put in the chat, and you can also consult it on our website, um, the report on biodigital, uh, the second report on biodigital, where you can also find the first one. And we've also put a link to the sense-making report that has been mentioned here. 
To learn more about Foresight and read our latest reports, please visit horizons.tc.ca.